opportunity to come out today on this kind of dreary Saturday afternoon. Uh, thanks to the people who came early and helped set up. That was a real pleasure to have so many, uh, so many uh, uh, working hands. Uh, we're going to get started right off the bat here. The plan is that Elizabeth uh, will speak for a few minutes, I will speak for a few minutes, and we promise not to be long-winded, and then we will open um, it up to discussion. I may be a bit of a biased moderator, but I will nevertheless moderate um, and just uh, make sure that uh, we try to get people's uh, questions in roughly the, answer, uh, roughly the order in which they're coming. So it's my enormous pleasure and honor to welcome our guest from out of town, <coughs> Elizabeth May, who is, as you all know, is the leader of the Green Party of Canada and a member of Parliament for Saanich Gulf Islands. Uh, Elizabeth is well known to you all, and I won't say anything more. I accept to say how delighted we are that she was willing to um, to do this session with us today. So Elizabeth, you have the floor. Well, thank you. Well, I'm very, very pleased to, to have a chance to talk about doing politics differently because at, at, at Jan and I talked about earlier and decided we're going to try to keep our remarks fairly brief so we can open it up and, and hear from you about what kind of concerns you might have or how we might together do politics differently. Uh, I'm very at home in the Green Party, largely because it's the most nonpartisan of the parties. Uh, I, I would, if I could wave a magic wand and eliminate all political parties, I would do so. Uh, and then we would have a number of people running to be your MLA, running to be your member of parliament, and they wouldn't be uh, there uh, on behalf of a political party, they'd be there on their own merits in a representative democracy. Uh, Westminster parliamentary democracy, which is our system, uh, which is increasingly morphing into something more like a, a U.S. presidential system, but our, our, our constitution is designed around Westminster parliamentary democracy, in which every member of parliament is equal, in which members of parliament work for their constituents, uh, it's, it's, it's become, there's, there's a lot more I could say about the, why, the whys and wherefores of the, of the increased presence and omnipresence of political parties in controlling what members of parliament do and say. And I think it's, it's uh, quite the enemy of democracy. The reason I love, I'm happy with the Green Party, one of the founders, probably the founder of the German Green Party, which was the second Green Party in the world, the first one was in New Zealand and called itself the Values Party. But people generally look to the German Greens as the, as the first uh, significant Green Party globally. And the founder, Petra Kelly, with whom, with whom I had great honor of working in the late 80s and early 90s, she used to call the Green Party the anti-party party. So, uh, okay, good, I'm not the first one to hate political parties while leading the Green Party. Um, it's, it's a problem. So in doing politics differently, what I've tried to do as a member of parliament, so I'll just speak to myself, and it is to try, and, I, and I, actually I shouldn't just say this about myself, this is about all of our candidates across the country. I'm always hearing from my colleagues in the House of Commons who are elected as conservatives or new Democrats or as liberals, uh, they'll stop and say, by the way, your green candidate in my riding was the nicest person. <laughs> and they were the only ones who were always really respectful in the debates, and I got along with so and so so well so you know and in my case yes it we do believe that we're trying to champion high road politics so you'll never see the green party of canada run an attack ad uh you know and one of the things that made me really thrilled in one of the election campaigns i was working in was a letter to the editor in the newspaper that said they'd seen some they would noticed on their morning drive to work that some campaign signs had been knocked over um, some Green Party signs have been knocked over, some NDP signs have been knocked over. And as they drove home from work, they saw that a Green Party volunteer with a bicycle put to the side of a tree had put back up the Green Party sign and was busy putting back up the NDP sign and putting back up, you know, as long as we're there, let's... So that's our policy, actually. If you're fixing the signs while you're there, fix all the signs. You know, so there's, there's, a, there's a lot of value to that just in being able to conduct yourself differently. Uh, in the House of Commons, it is, it, it's been noticed by my friends there, that, and they wouldn't be my friends if it wasn't noticed, but I might as well say, because when I was elected, I was the first Green Party member of Parliament, which means I was there by myself. 
if I'd only been willing to speak to members of my own caucus, which I hate to say is the case with a lot of the other caucuses, well, as you can see, it would have been a very lonely existence. Um, I compared notes with Deb Gray, because I love Deb Gray, and she was, she now lives on Vancouver Island, but she was, of course, the first elected Reform Party MP. If you look at the progress of a party, they went from one elected MP to what essentially now is majority parliament from the party for which, you know, even though they, you know, they amalgamated and they were changing in the names, she was really a trailblazer. She had a miserable time as the first reform MP. And I decided before walking in the doors of Parliament that I didn't want to have a miserable time. So the first thing I did was you know, recognizing that we had had a tremendous turnover in the 2011 campaign. A very high proportion out of 308 seats, 110 new MPs, well, well 110 of the MPs were new, put it that way. So it's a, quite a lot of turnover. And of the 110 newly elected MPs, there were hardly any new, brand new liberals, but there were quite a lot of brand new conservatives and quite a lot of brand new new Democrats. So I decided to host a party. It was really hard to get the invitations for this party out. It was called the Non-Party Party, Come and Break the Ice. That's all the invitations. Said. So first we sent it to all the emails for the newly elected MPs, and we weren't getting any um, and this was for the first Monday that Parliament was sitting. Right? So this was in June of 2011. And we hadn't had any RSVPs. So I said to my chief of staff, because we were trying, we didn't have an office yet. It was so new that, and I was at the bottom of the totem pole for getting an office. So we were still working out of the Green Party office. And I said to Deborah, well, maybe all these new MPs are like us, and we actually don't have access to the email address we've been given. I better figure out another way to get them invited. So I said, make, let's make hard copy invitations. And I had volunteers helping address all the invitations. And I said, I'll just take them into Parliament on the first day when we're electing the speaker, which is a Friday, and my party's on the Monday night. So at least then I can hand them out to people, or I could get what I really had planned was to ask the pages, because I've, you know, I've been around Parliament long enough to know the pages can put things on the desks of all the members, and that would save me a lot of time. <coughs> so on the Friday, I get there, and I have all my invitations organized, the NDP invitations, liberal invitations, one block. Can you imagine how sad to be the newly elected member of a party that had gone from being big down to one? I mean, regardless of what you think about the block, that was kind of a sad experience for Jean-Francois Fontaine, who's a nice guy. On the other hand, I relish what just happened to P.K. Pelado. I think <laughs> good enough for him. But anyway. Um, <laughs> The, the, the Liberals had a few new ones, the NDP had a lot of new ones. And I went to the pages and I said, can you put these invitations on everybody's desk? They said, what? I said, well, they said, well we have to, we can't do that until you get clearance from each of the party whips. Silly me, I thought this would be easy. <laughs> so I went to Gordon O'Connor from the Conservatives and I said, would you mind letting the whips put these invitations on everybody's desk? It's just for a party that I'm having, it's a reception to welcome new MPs. And he said, no. And I went to the NDP whip and I said, would you mind letting, no, no, that's not gonna. So then, all right, so I'm, I'm looking through the invitations, trying to find people, match their face to their name. And it's how I made a lot of friends. The election of a speaker in parliament, by the way, is a long process by secret ballot where we all queue up and go around and put, and it takes a long time. So fortunately, I had enough time to figure all this out. So I'm going through the invitations and going to the NDP area and, finding names on the desks that match the invitation. Of, and this wonderful young newly elected MP, Alexandrine Matantres, came over to me and said, Madame May, what are you doing? And I said, I'm trying to find everybody to invite them to my party. She said, give me some. I'll, go, I'll do the NDP with you. So, the, so we became friends right away. And then I found another concern. Anyway, the party was great. <laughs> but despite the hurdles, I mean, imagine how much partisanship there is in the place that you can't ask the party whip for permission to invite people to a nonpartisan party. Anyway, doing politics differently has served me very well in the House. I've made friends in all the caucuses. I believe it's important to wrestle hyperpartisanship to the ground. I would like to see, I'll cut to the chase of some of the things you might want to discuss later, I would love to see cooperation between party leaders. It is the party, party policy of the federal Green Party to uh, it, uh, mandated to try to seek cooperation in the next election 
for a one-time only cooperation agreement of some form in exchange for getting rid of first past the post. And I know there's a fair vote in Canada. Mark has a booth back there. If you don't know about what's wrong with first past the post, please ask when we get to discussion and we can, we can talk about how much better things could be if we got rid of it. Uh, I'm heartened by the fact that my private member's bill, I don't know how many of you know that I've, I've, I've been hoping to see this passed, is a national strategy to deal with Lyme disease. So the national Lyme disease strategy, most private member's bills uh, don't succeed, and I don't think a lot of people would have had a lot of hope for a private member's bill from somebody representing, at, at this point, a party of two MPs. But I have all party support for my private member's bill. And yes, the issue is important, and the issue is nonpartisan, but I'm quite sure that if I'd been behaving the way other parties behave in the House, you know, with questions across the aisle, like, when did you stop beating your wife? Or how come, you know, are you, you know, how scummy are you really? Those kinds of questions. They don't really engender respect. And I believe party politics is crippling effective democracy. And that if we conduct ourselves differently and respectfully, not only will we get more done in Parliament, but we'll see more Canadians willing to vote, willing to participate, not looking at question period and changing the channel and wondering why this group doesn't have adult supervision. So it's a, uh, you know, uh, as a mom, sometimes I actually have taken the floor to us on a point of order to the speaker if we, if we don't think it's time for a time out for, you know. In any case, I won't go on and on. I have lots of funny stories about life in Parliament. I do love my job and I love Parliament and it is salvageable. But democracy in Canada right now is on life support. And there are some things we can all do. Um, Michael Chong is a conservative member of Parliament from Wellington Halton Hills in Ontario. His private member's bill 559 is very much worthy of support. And conservatives are, you know, and I know speaking in Calgary that you all have members of Parliament who are conservatives. Don't give up on reaching out to them to tell them you want them to vote yes to Michael Chong's bill. And I can get into more, it, it, it reduces the power of the leader's offices. And the leaders in each of the parties, other than the Greens, have far too much power. Our own bylaws restrict my powers. And the, the other thing, of course, is that right now we have a very vigorous debate across Canada, I hope, about Bill C-23, uh, the Unfair Elections Act. So I'm happy to talk about any of those things. Anyway, that's all I wanted to say by way of introduction. I'll turn it over to Janet. Thank you. Well, uh, following Elizabeth May's act isn't, isn't difficult, it's impossible. So um, I do have some notes prepared, um, and uh, I'll, I'll try to be, uh, I will be brief, I won't be, won't be lengthy, it won't be quite the uh, sort of ad lib that uh, Elizabeth is so good at, a little more formal than that. Um, I've been giving a lot of thought over the last while to doing politics differently because um, I too am, am very enthusiastic about being a part of the Green Party because I think we can do politics differently. I think we come with less baggage. You, know, you can say we've got nothing to lose. <laughs> we've got Elizabeth to lose and Bruce, but I mean, basically now we're going to be on a whole lot to lose. But so what? What it means is we can do what we think is right and not be too burdened by the past. So when I've thought about doing politics differently, and also to explain a little bit more about what I mean about these things, but I think we have to do at least the following five things. One is I think we have to build trust, because trust has been demolished between the electorate and uh, both politicians and many bureaucrats, especially senior and very highly paid bureaucrats. Two, we have to cooperate with other progressively minded parties. Three, I think we have to be brave. Four, I think we have to try to inspire hope after telling some difficult truths. I think we have to try to inspire hope. And we have to walk the talk, which of course gets back to um, trying to build trust and establish confidence. So the building trust part is pretty obvious, isn't it? An awful lot has been demolished and Elizabeth has already referred to this. And Elizabeth said it, democracy is on life support. This is true in many parts of the democratic world, by the way. We are not, maybe misery likes company, we're not exactly alone in this. But I do have to say that I think in Alberta, we're in a particularly dire set of circumstances. 
We have had one party rule for 43 years and counting. And that has, and if you don't have to go on about uh, in the individuals who've been part of those governments and their particular faults or strengths, it's not about that. If it had been a Green Party government, which of course we can't imagine, right, that it would have been a Green Party government for 43 years, but I'd still be here saying we need change. We desperately need change. Um, any power goes to people's heads. You know the aphorism, right? Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. You have to not only know that it's possible that you might lose, you actually have to lose from time to time to keep things um, in the way that, uh, that they have to be. So what do we do? What do we do about those of us who are willing to talk about the fact that we've got to rebuild trust? Well, and we have one of my favorite people and an expert on trust right here, Trudy Govier, um, from whom I've learned many things over the years, but one of them certainly has been from her work on trust. And we all know it, don't we? It's so much easier to destroy trust. It can be done so easily and so quickly and so much more difficult to build it up. But some of the things we have to do, and again, Elizabeth has already used some of these words, we have to show respect. We have to show respect for everybody who's involved in the process, of course voters, but people who are involved and working intently from other political parties. Unless there's clear evidence to the contrary, we've got to assume that they're well-intentioned, and we've got to treat them um, in that way. And we have to respect the process. I mean, I guess probably goes without saying that Greens wouldn't engage in some of the same behavior. But the kind of behavior that we've seen from some of the other political parties in campaigns across the country, with the result robocalls and so on, actually, think about it, misleading people as to where, knowingly misleading people as to where they're supposed to go to vote. I mean, you've got to call it and name it for what it is every time we see that kind of thing. So have to show respect for each other, uh, for the voter, of course. Um, we have uh, uh, many of us occasion to, to quote our, our uh, well-known Mayor, Mayor Nenshi, about practicing the politics of complete sentences. You know, we're told time and time again, people don't have time to think, they don't want, they're not interested in ideas. My, I'll tell you, my personal experience is directly the opposite, is directly the opposite. Yes, people are busy, you have to catch them at the right time. People want to be treated as thinking human, the thinking human beings that they are. So the politics of complete sentences, the politics of ideas, and of course there's many other ways. But to make it concrete in doing politics differently, Elizabeth has already talked about it as well. We have to be ready to cooperate with other progressively minded parties. Nowhere, <coughs> nowhere is that more true than in Alberta. Nowhere. We have a not completely ineffective official opposition right now in the wild rose. And the wild rose may be poised, depends what happens in the next few months, in the next year or year and a half. Maybe wild rose is finally going to depose the PCs so that that particular problem may be put to an end. But to get progressive politics stronger in Alberta, to get a more humane, a more gentle, a more better informed kind of politics practiced in Alberta, we're going to have to have more progressively minded MLAs in the legislature. And I submit to you that there's no way that that's going to happen in any significant numbers, and the Greens certainly aren't going to get elected in any numbers, real numbers, unless we cooperate with other parties. What does that mean? Well, some parties are talking of cooperation game, and they talk about how they're going to cooperate with parties when they're elected. When they, once they get into the ledge, once they get into Parliament, and Elizabeth's an expert on the subject of how that can be done and the various forms it can take. But in Alberta, we've got to do a whole lot of cooperating before the voters actually go to the polls. There isn't going to be any after if we don't cooperate before Election Day. And at an absolute minimum, at an absolute minimum, a values-driven party like the Green Party, which has nothing to lose and really is full of the best of intentions, should not be running candidates against the already sitting progressive um, MLAs. We should not, to make it concrete and clear, we should not be running against the five Liberals and the four New Democrat MLAs, at an absolute minimum. I would say more than that, but I'm going to go that far today that we've got to be crystal clear about that. Because think <laughs> When the day comes, and Elizabeth's referred to the need for proportional representation, when the day comes when we have proportional representation, and every vote actually counts, or more likely to have more weight and actual have impact and count, 
then we're in another, we're in another ball game. That, that would be then, but we're talking about now. And what we're faced with now is the political reality we have to deal with, and we have to do it the best job we can. And that way we help, by the way, to rebuild trust and confidence. That we're not in politics for ourselves solely, we're in politics for a better future for Albertans. And a better future for Albertans will only come about when we have more progressively minded people in the legislature. We have to cooperate with the other progressive parties to get there. The third point I wanted to make, and again, I won't go on to in a lengthy fashion, we have to be brave enough to tell the truth. Now this might sound easy for a political party that has in essence nothing to lose. That might sound really easy. But you know, social pressure is an insidious and pervasive thing. It's not actually really easy to stand up and tell the truth. Because Alberta can look so seductively good, doesn't it? The appearances are so superficially wonderful. And yet, so many serious issues are not being addressed. And they're in not being addressed effectively, problems fester, and some of them are becoming demonstrably worse. I don't have the time to go through them. I'll just note things like our lamentable and shameful failure to lead on climate change. It is not an excuse that Albertans are only responsible for a relatively small proportion of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. That's true. That's true. We're a relatively small number of people on the world scene. But we're privileged. We're privileged and we're relatively affluent. And we should be leading the way, not laggards, and not looking for excuses to let ourselves off. <laughs> about a couple of other things because the growing gap between rich and poor is again another one of those really critical social phenomena that really bites in Alberta. Again, it can look so good, right? Drive downtown, look at those gleaming towers and so on. There's a high percentage, there's a high percentage, over 10% of Calgarians use food banks every year. 10% of what looks like a city where the streets are paved with gold. And for some people they are paved with almost gold or almost paved with gold but a lot of people are hurting. And in fact, the whole boom phenomenon, as we know if we live here, is that prices go up and then the poor are hurt even more. So it's something that's so acute, again, so shameful, and it's something we could be doing more about, and if we were doing a better job of acting as owners of our resources, we would have more revenues. If we had a fair taxation system, and not a flat one, and you know, low, low corporate taxes, we could afford to do a whole lot more. I'm not going to go on about this because I'm sure many of you are just itching to, um, to uh, get at the uh, uh, asking of questions, but I couldn't resist the opportunity because it's such a great, um, it's a great topic, doing politics differently, to mention one of my political heroes, and that's Václav Havel, the late president of the Czech Republic. He was a dissident playwright, as, as some of you may know, before he became, before the Velvet Revolution, he became president of, of his country. And he gave, he wrote, speak, uh, he wrote essays, fabulous essays and he wrote plays, but he gave what's considered by many to be his best, uh, his best speech at least, in New Year's of 1990. And he said this, think about, think about the parallels to our own situation. I don't want to overstate, because again, don't want to overstate, but he said, for 40 years, you heard the same thing in different variations from my predecessors. How our country, read our province, flourishes. How many tons of steel we produced, think of barrels of oil. How happy we all are. How we trusted our government and what bright perspectives were unfolding in front of us. And he said to his people, I assume you did not nominate me to this office so that I too would lie to you. It's not always easy to tell the truth, but I think we have to be brave enough to do so. Havel also talked about politics. He said, let us teach both ourselves and others that politics does, politics does not have to be the art of intrigues, secret agreements, and pragmatic maneuverings. But it can also be the art of making both ourselves and the world better. And I think it can be that. He also announced, what's your advice to politicians? He said, write your own speeches, Elizabeth, and express hard truths in a polite way. And I thought that that was pretty wonderful. OK, my fourth point was, we do have to inspire hope. After we politely and bravely tell the truth, and some of those truths are not very pretty, we do have to inspire hope. It doesn't have to be this way. It could be much better. As Havel said, we have to tell hard truths in a polite way, but
but a large part of our message in doing politics differently must be this. It doesn't have to be this way. Things could be different and much better. We Albertans are still free to vote differently and have a government that is committed to meeting human needs, including an environment strong enough and healthy enough to support life well, and not a government in the interests of a select few. We could have basic dental coverage. We could have, as in Quebec, publicly subsidized daycare. We could have enough affordable housing and enough resources to support people who will be forced to transition into new careers as the economy changes away from the old, dirty uh, industries. Say we can't afford these things, we have the faintest idea of what we could actually afford. We could stop making stupid expenditures, like giving away billions of money on carbon capture and storage, and we could bring in more by way of taxes. There's no reason at all why Alberta should be a tax haven, and be assured, that's what it is. Of course, in doing so, we should not impose the costs of our expenditures, present expenditures, on future generations. Greens should and do insist on fiscal responsibility. But if we collectively pay our way, then there's no reason at all why we can't have a better, more decent, fair, and sustainable society. So I'm going to wrap up by, with my fifth point, which is walk the talk. And I'm going to go back to the need to cooperate with other progressive parties. Now, I've lived in Calgary for a long time, since 1973. And I've lived in Calgary Mountain View, where I now live for, I think it's 38 years. There is nothing that I would like better than to run in Calgary Mountain View. There is nothing more natural where I walk the streets and frequent the local shops and all of that. But to do so would run up precisely against what I just said, is that we have to practice the politics of advancing the public interest and not practice stupid politics. If I were to run as a Green, the leader of the Green Party, uh, in Calgary Mountain View, I would be running against David Swan, my friend, a uh, person I greatly respect, who's here, who is the sitting MLA. I'm not going to do that, and I'll do everything in my power to make sure that no Green does that, because it's free. <laughs> so a group of us have been thinking about, you know, what are the ridings in Calgary that look reasonably good or better rather than worse for Greens, and um, we've given it a lot of thought, and um, I'm uh, going to be running in Calgary Fort, which is where we sit today. <laughs> formal as we can be. And if anyone, if there's some people standing in the back, there's still some seats. There's plenty of chairs. There's some chairs here that are set up already if you want to sit, so just to let you know. It's, glad, it's great to have an event where you have to get out more chairs, so it's a good sign. I see Graham first. Yes. I won't ask you the question you think I would really ask. <laughs> but um, Janet, as Janet knows, I've done a fair amount of research for a discussion we might be involved in on proportional representation. And uh, it, good stuff. It turns out though, that there are five or six different varieties of proportional At representation. Least. From complete proportional representation to various mixtures of uh, first past and post plus proportional representatives. Um, some are very convoluted, by the way, in a degree of political science to organize to understand how the electoral system works for certain varieties of proportional representation. So my question to both of you, and hopefully the answer is the same, I guess, is <laughs> what what variety of proportional representation do you support for Canada? Yeah, I'm sure Elizabeth. Well, the official position of the Green Party of Canada is that that's a question for Canadians to answer. So that I can tell you what my personal view is, but the party at the federal level has deliberately chosen to remain agnostic because our current policy is that we would move to proportional representation but through a consultative process with Canadians to choose the method Canadians most like. Now, when I, when I wrote my last book, I took a lot of time to read. My last book was called Losing Confidence, Power Politics and the Crisis in Canadian Democracy. And I looked around the world at the models that might work best for Canada, both in terms of how we get from this very perverse voting system we have now to the change we want. And 
And I was very struck by the experience in New Zealand, that being that New Zealand is, like Canada, part of the Commonwealth, has Westminster parliamentary democracy, is a constitutional monarchy, all of those elements, right? And New Zealand uh, had, as Canada has had, you know, a, a number of elections where the perverse results were due to first past the post and began to get even parties that had previously enjoyed the first past the post and felt they had power due to it, begin to get a bit um, unhappy with it. Right? So they went to a pledge that after the next election they would have a royal commission. So just not to go through the whole story, but the, the, in New Zealand there was a tremendous education effort at the grassroots through this royal commission that held hearings across the country. And New Zealanders ended up deciding, and they had a referendum on it. And they recently, interestingly enough, they went to proportional representation in the mid-90s. In the last federal election in New Zealand, they had a question on the ballot, how do you like proportional representation? Shall we keep it? And overwhelmingly, people voted to keep it. So they keep touching base on it. They went with mixed member proportional. And that would be my choice. Now, that's a personal choice. Uh, I wouldn't be against single transferable vote. We had a single transferable vote referendum in British Columbia that got over 60% support, but they'd chosen a threshold higher than 60%. And I had friends who actually voted against single transferable vote because they wanted mixed member proportional. I was like, no, 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 we don't want to keep first past the post if that's what you're going to do. So it, it can get to be a bit of a, and sometimes it reminds me of the Lilliputian argument over which end of the egg you crack. The main thing is to get rid of first past the post because it's so unfair. Um, but I would be categorically against pure PR. Only Israel and Italy have pure PR. And whenever you raise proportional representation with anyone who wants to put the kibosh on it, they say, well, look at Israel, look at Italy. That's crazy. Like, oh, that's pretty crazy. I like any system that retains having a connection to local so that your member of parliament has some connection to local place. And that's the case with single transferable vote and with mixed member proportional. Uh, the goal of both systems, of course, in a nutshell, which is, which is not hard to explain, is that every vote will count. There will be no orphaned votes. And by orphaned votes, a term that Fair Vote Canada made up. If you, if you live in a riding, which all of you do, which is likely to go conservative, a lot of people feel as though their vote didn't count for anything. And those are called the orphaned votes. So if, if, you're, if we had had mixed member proportional at the end of the 2011 election, the conservatives would not have had a majority. The liberals would have had more seats than they ended up with. The NDP would have had slightly fewer seats than they ended up with. The Greens would have had far more seats than we ended up with. Uh, to me, the main impetus for the change is not because it advantages the Green Party. Uh, the more research I do into this, the main reason to get rid of uh, first past the post is I think it's a significant factor in driving down voter turnout. Because people, you know, and, and it, it leads to this, you know, crazy fixation on quote unquote splitting the vote, whereas the problem in Canada isn't vote splitting, it's vote abandoning. The single largest voting bloc in the last election could have formed a majority government with the heading, we stayed home party, right? So that was a, there were more Canadians who didn't go to vote than actually voted for conservative candidates. Then you have a majority parliament. So yeah, there's a lot, of, I've just to cut to the quick there, to the chase there, Graham. I would be very happy with any number of proportional representational systems Stéphane Dion has invented his own hybrid, which is even more complicated to explain <laughs> than any, any of the others that are existing. The one piece of good news is that proportional representation can be complicated to explain, but for people going to vote, it's very easy. It's, an e it's just as easy as the voting process that we have now, but the results are fairer. And I think the big mistake that a lot of us make who want PR is to spend too much time explaining how PR works and not nearly enough time explaining what's wrong with first past the post, winner take all. And you know, it, it, um, it, it's quite a perverse system when a minority of the voters, even of the 60% of Canadians who voted in the last election, 39% voted conservative, but in electing a majority house, going back to my earlier point about, about democracy being on life support, 
Prime Minister's office in this country right now has extreme and unhealthy powers that are not part of our constitutional history. They're not part of Westminster parliamentary democracy. There is no such thing as PMO, as a central agency in Westminster parliamentary democracy. It should be eliminated. But it has unhealthy. <laughs> policy of the, the Green Party of Alberta that we do want to get rid of first past the post, that we would propose to do it in a two-stage manner, which is first to have the question put to the voters of Alberta, are you ready to move away, do you want to move away from first past the post? We would convene a citizen's assembly, we don't have any particular mechanism in mind, it might be like the mechanism they used in BC, might not. And that assembly would, um, would, do, would do two things. It would help to um, inform people as to uh, the merits and demerits of various systems. And it would actually put forward a favored alternative. And then you'd have a second vote on that favored alternative. Because the problem of combining the do you want change with here vote on this particular form of change is that you get what Elizabeth in, in part just described. And that is people saying no, but you don't know why they're saying no. Right? You don't know why they were, whether they want to stick with the current system or whether you don't know what they want. So that would be that would be our approach to the whole thing. Yes, please. Yeah. And then, sort of after you, sir, uh, follow in the back. Yeah. Can we ask people to stand up and ask the question? Because then your voice carries more. Yeah, sure. Okay, I'm Mark Blake, uh, Calgary Southeast and Beverly. I'm not sure which one is actually. Why not? Why not just put in a law making everybody vote? I think they have that in Australia. There are many countries around the world that have mandatory voting. Uh, Australia is the one question. Australia is the one that's the best known uh, example. Australians, I think the last election it was 97% uh, voter turnout. If you don't vote, you're fine. Now we could do that. Certainly, it would be an improvement over the current system. I like the idea of having a voting system which in which people vote because they want to. Uh, and they feel their vote's going to have make a difference. But it's not a bad suggestion. One of my friends in Parliament for many years, he since passed away, but he was a member of Parliament for Toronto, Davenport, for approximately 30-some years, a wonderful liberal environmentalist named Charles Katcha. And every single year, he put in a private member's bill to make voting in Canada mandatory and to change the ballot so at the bottom of all the names of candidates there'd be a box for none of the above. <laughs> so you would have an option when you went to vote. There are countries that have had that for forever. Yeah. None it, of the above. It, did, it didn't catch on. <laughs> no, 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 no
And nobody trusts anybody else. Nobody trusts anybody else. They, they, if you, you know, they don't trust you to do your bit if they, if they restrain themselves and, and don't run or whatever. So my view about that is, number one, it's pointless and silly to run against incumbents that you actually want to see in office. I ask you, why would anybody run against David, against Kent Hare, against Rachel Notley? It doesn't make any sense. We so want them in the legislature. Well, no, I, and that's a long, no, I, no, I actually don't, I actually, no, I, I actually don't think that. It, it would be a long conversation, because it's a, it is a long, complicated conversation, but no, I don't think that, because while Elizabeth is down on parties, and I get that, we're stuck with them from the time, from, from the time being. So, you know, that's another story. Well, uh, but yeah. somebody, has to, somebody has to take the first step. Somebody has to be willing to say, we actually going to walk the talk. Can I actually believe what we're saying? And we're going to do it. I have, to, I have to make sure people don't think that's the federal Green Party plan. So I'm sorry, Ted, but the Greens federally plan to run in every riding. And I'm seeking cooperation with the Liberals and the New Democrats at every turn. Uh, and let me tell you what happened. The first example of, of and I do believe in cross party cooperation, the first example of doing that was when Stefan Dion was lead, Liberal leader. And he didn't run a uh, liberal against me where I was running. And this is based on a very old parliamentary tradition called uh, leader's courtesy. The liberals hadn't run anyone against Stockwell Day when he ran to get in the House because he was the new conservative leader. So alliance leader, I guess, at the time. So leader's courtesy agreements have existed for a long time. And we stepped up and made a statement jointly that we were doing this because we felt the climate crisis trumped partisanship. Partisanship shouldn't count in a situation like this. Now, we were immediately attacked by the NDP as though we had done something, well, they said it was anti democratic, scummy backroom deal. And what I also learned from that experience was that the voters don't belong to a party. The people who traditionally voted liberal in Central Nova, where I was running against Peter McKay, a lot of them were so angry at the liberals that they went and voted for Peter McKay. A lot of them voted green, but not in, you know, I was a very close second. And at the point that I could have won, the NDP went out and said, the Greens are running a distant third. If you want to stop Peter McKay, vote NDP. They knew when they said that, that it wasn't true. And they knew that what they were doing was making sure they would do anything to stop a Green from entering the House of Commons. Now, I don't say this to speak bitterness about other parties and how they reacted to cooperation but to say that it was a really interesting learning experience for me about how voters feel when a party takes itself out of the game and says we're not running anybody there. A lot of voters end up feeling, and, and it might be the case, that the Liberal Party members in uh, a riding would be angry as the Liberals were in Central Nova when Stefan Dion didn't run a candidate. You don't know how people are going to react, and I think that cooperation can come in many different ways. And I've tried to reach out, and let me give you a perfect example that's from Calgary. The best example of political cooperation in recent political history was cooperation that the voters never knew about until the election was over. So when Joe Clark was running in Calgary Center, and the threat was from reform, and Anne McClellan was running in Edmonton, and the threat was from reform, there was a liberal candidate running against Joe Clark. There was a progressive conservative candidate running against Anne McClellan. But all the volunteers and all the people who usually worked hard to elect a liberal Calgary Center worked for Joe Clark. And all the progressive conservatives who usually would have worked hard in Edmonton to elect a progressive conservative worked for Anne McClellan. It was a very interesting cooperation agreement because it made sure Anne McClellan won her seat. It made sure Joe Clark won his seat. And unlike what happened to Stéphane Dion and me, there was nobody screaming that it was an anti-democratic attempt to deprive voters who wanted to vote liberal or progressive conservative of the option they wanted. So it's a complicated area. My own view, also number one, the Greens, I don't get to control what the federal Greens do. Um, if it was up to me, I wouldn't run in some ridings, but it's not up to me. It's up to our local electoral district associations and our local candidates. And the most we can do about it at the federal level is 
is I could go back to the party and say, okay, you gave me a mandate to achieve cooperation in the interest of getting rid of first past the post. This is an offer I now have from Justin Trudeau. Or this is an offer I now have from Tom Mulcair. And I've got to go back to the party as, an offer, as, a, as, as a grassroots organization at the federal level and say, can we take this? This is the arrangement. The current view of the party is we're going to run in every 330, because there's 30 new federal ridings in this election, run in 338 ridings. And I've written to every single NDP and liberal MP. I wrote, a, I wrote hard copies, so the letters couldn't be sent around on email. They were all marked personal confidential. I signed everyone personally and wrote personal PSs to all the MPs. And this was in December of 2012, right after the by-election that happened in Calgary Center in Victoria. And I wrote them and said, you know, it's going to take a while for the leadership of the parties to sit down and talk about cooperation to get to the force representation. But here's an idea. Maybe we could, because, you know, as individual MPs, form an ad hoc working group to figure out what would cooperation look like. We've got a spectrum that's everything from merger of parties to shared nomination meetings, which was what uh, Joyce Murray had been arguing in the liberal nomination leadership race, which was also what Nathan Cullen had been arguing for in the NDP race. It's not that this cooperation discussion is limited to Greens. It can become very active in the leadership races of the other parties. All the way through to what I just described between Joe Clark and Anne McClellan. There's a range of opportunities for cooperation. And I also said to every MP in the letter I wrote, there's also the question of when we say we want to get rid of first past the post, how would we do that? Would we have a referendum? Would, is there a preference for mixed member proportional? At this point, the Liberal Party doesn't favor proportional representation. How would we get to that? So my, when the letter was, I remember it was December 10th, I had it hand delivered to every single office of all the opposition MPs. And that day, I had great reaction. I had so many liberal and NDP members of Parliament coming up to me and saying, this is great, this is just what we need. We'll start the conversation you know, among us, and then when the leaders are ready to talk about it, go, this is, you know. and I was calling my office, and they were getting calls saying, is our staff allowed to come? I mean, Gosh, what kind of room are we gonna get? This is gonna be a really big meeting. <laughs> Next day, whole stream of MPs came on and said, I'm not allowed to do it. Uh, I'm really sorry, I'm not allowed to do it. And then, uh, I don't know why they did this in the NDP, but they released my letter to the media and attacked me for doing it, and said that it was an, e it was an effort to undermine Tom Mulcair, that's what they said. And um, so it became a public letter, and it, you can find it somewhere on McLean's website. But I mean, it's, the range of possibilities for what we could do is pretty much only limited by our creativity. For myself, during the next election campaign, so you won't be too dismayed with me, I, if I can't find a cooperation agreement for the Liberals and the New Democrats that actually works, as long as I can get in the national leaders debate, which of course remains to be seen because neither Mulcair nor Trudeau have said they will, they will allow me in, but in any case, if I can get in the next leaders debate, I think I can find ways to do what I've, what I've been calling in my own head um, unilateral cooperation, <laughs> which gets back to your question again. <laughs> We'll figure, so we have to figure out how to make, we, basically I got elected in Spanish Gulf Islands because there was cooperation, but it wasn't for party leadership. The NDP and the Liberals and the Conservatives ran really hard to keep me out of the House of Commons. But the, their usual voter base figured out for themselves, we really ought to elect Elizabeth. And it began to be a very grassroots effort at cooperation. And riding by riding, so this is another place I, with all respect, disagree with Janet. We can win seats, and we will win seats federally without cooperation. And we can win enough seats to have the balance of power in a minority parliament after the next election. We can win enough seats to be a recognized party with all the you know, first questions and question period and all the things that parties with more than all we need is 12 members of parliament. I mean, I am recognized as the Green Party in the House. Bruce Heyer is recognized as Green Party in the House. But we don't have access to committees. We're not allowed a question every single day. Uh, there are a lot of procedural rules that parties with fewer than 12 MPs are excluded from, not to mention all the resources that go to additional to parties with more than 12. We can do that in the existing voting system because we've made a breakthrough in one place. We have an MP from another place. We can elect more than 12 MPs in the next federal election and form as I said, the balance of power in a minority parliament. 
So that's just to share with you a plan that will, I hope, cheer you up. That the, the <laughs> politi you know, even under the current horrible voting system, we are not doomed. That's all I'd like to say. And, and, and I'm certainly not doomed, certainly not doomed at the federal level. I think what, when politics is local, right? Somebody, somebody once said all politics is local. Tip O'Neill. Ask me, I'm, I'm walking Google. <laughs> so let me just say that, that what, and I'm not saying no Green can ever get elected in Alberta without there being cooperation, don't get me wrong, I, I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that, and let's just talk about the federal level in Alberta, I think I did not earn any friends at that meeting in Edmonton that was run by the federal Greens when I reacted with horror at the idea that Greens would run against our only non-conservative MP in the province, Linda Duncan. Now imagine that the Greens choose a good candidate to run against Linda Duncan and really go into it and stir it up and really campaign. And if you're not going to do that, why bother, I would say. And Linda Duncan loses by only a little bit. You don't win as the Green candidate, because that's not what's going to happen in Edmonton Strathcona. If the ND doesn't win, it's not going to be it's going to be somebody else that most of us in this room would rather not see in, in Parliament. So I would say, have you advanced, because to my mind, this is the test. Have you advanced the public interest? Can you look at yourself in the mirror and say, what I did was for the public good. The world, Canada, Alberta, is a better place because we ran hard against Linda Duncan, and we beat Linda Duncan so that the Conservatives could win. And ask you a hard question. Yes, Linda's, good. One, Linda's one of my oldest friends. I've known Linda since 1983. We're environmental lawyers. We work together. I yeah. love her. Why isn't she a green? No. What has she been able to do? My question is, what has Tom O'Care allowed her to do? Mm. Has she been allowed to speak one single word on the environment since he became leader? You can go through cancer. I'll save you the time. The answer is no. But the problem is, we wouldn't get a good person to replace it. But anyway, we, 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 hold on, Chris. There's I'm not arguing against Linda. I love Linda, and I agree generally with your thesis. But we also have to put the other parties under scrutiny. And we need, OK, sorry. I need to get a little bit into why I just said that. We have got to get Michael Chong's bill passed so that leaders of parties, whether liberal or Democrat, lose the, what, what Michael Chong's bill does is take away the right the, the requirement of the leader's signature on the nomination papers for every candidate. Mm -hmm. Once we do that, there won't be a club with which the leader of a party can threaten their own members. And we need to have members of parliament who are free to speak what they want to say based on their own concerns and their own knowledge and their own, you know, the what their constituents want them to say. These, this is pretty critical that we have democracy around what individual members of parliament are allowed to do, that the, the, the control over every single breath taken by conservative, liberal, and Democrat members of parliament is no small matter. They get elected and then they're really silenced, and that's not right. So I, you know, I, I'd like to liberate all the members of parliament, and the way to do that is to get Michael Chong's bill passed. So anything you can do put pressure on conservative <coughs> MPs in the Calgary area, so that, because we've got support from quite a lot of conservative backbenchers, we need more support for that bill. Mm -hmm. I just want to say that maybe sort of half face on <laughs> that we should do a pilot, do it once, for the sunset clause, let people experience voting, let's see what happens. I know I agree from a civil liberties perspective, it doesn't feel real good, but I think we should do it once. And actually, if you look at the Australian system, it's not just vote or else, it's kind of a two-tiered thing, it's quite interesting. I think Chris was recognized and then, oh, I said Matt. Okay, hold on. Uh, Chris, Matt, Grant, and then David. Does that sound right, Susan? Yes? Okay, Chris. Uh, just a simple uh, question. Um, in terms of our level of cooperation, um, how we talked about maybe a planned coalition instead of uh, trying to, you know, uh, not run candidates or do these other systems. If we just 
plan to form one go government from the beginning, uh, then it won't really matter uh, who's, who's, who's who, because we'll know that we'll, we'll have something progressive and that we still keep our individual voice within uh, those uh, parties. Uh, uh, the C word doesn't frighten me at all. I think it's a really good word. And, uh, yeah, I think, I think that's really, that's exactly, not just the C cooperation, but the C coalition. That's not happening at the federal level now, right? <laughs> so, I mean, we have a very, and, and in fairness, you have to, the history around what should have happened, which was a coalition in 2008, and then after prorogation, it was a very, it's one of the more devastating periods of Canadian political history that we would have uh, the the uh, abuse of Parliament and and contempt in the way the economic statement was brought forward with the threat to remove the per vote subsidy, which they then followed through on. I mean, I don't need to revisit that whole history. But then the prorogation, at the point that there was a signed agreement for a coalition, and then so from the point of view of the New Democrats, it was it was a, it was all in Ignatiev's hands. Ignatiev managed to oust. Replace him without a convention or any vote within the Liberal Party, and then renege on an agreement that Michael Ignati had actually signed, which was that they would, they had a completely functional agreement, a minority conservative parliament, and everything in place when the House resumed in January to walk that agreement down to the Governor General and say, okay, now. And instead, Ignati have said, no, basically, I, I want to win the election on my own terms. In other words, what he basically said is, I don't want to be, I don't want to have to have a cabinet with Jack Layton in it. And Ignatius was so arrogant that he thought it would be the work of a moment to call an election at his convenience and, and win. Now, Ignatius lost his own seat when the election finally rolled around. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, I, I, it, it, it's, it, it's a shocking situation what happened. So, you can, I, I don't want to be unfair to either of the other major opposition parties, as I say. Getting either of them to talk about a coalition before the next election, it's not just that they won't talk to me, the primary problem is they won't talk to each other. The bitterness from that experience is very raw. And so I don't think we'll see it. But if we do see a minority parliament at the end of the next election, and I think that is the likelihood, is a minority parliament. As long as we can elect enough Greens to form a balance of power, we're in the same position that many Green parties will have been in around the world in saying, okay, we negotiate with each of the parties in opposition. Who's prepared to get rid of first past the post? Who's prepared to bring in a real carbon plan? Okay, we will either be in a formal coalition with you or we will vote with you so long as we feel the policies are advancing the interests of what the majority of voters would have had had we not had first past the post. So you say, I think there's, yeah, there's, I, but I don't think we're going to see a coalition discussion at the federal level until after the next election. Uh, I understand DC MLA Andrew Weaver supports uh, refinery in Kitimat. He doesn't, actually. He doesn't. No. Uh, the, the news article. Headline writer was a bit over enthusiastic. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, so then in turn, uh, we'll. Uh... I'm glad you raised it though, because if anyone did think that, he wrote a. Like, he's not um, yet over being an academic and a scientist, so his idea of a blog in response to an incorrect headline is, I think, a nine page article on his website. So please go there and read it, and it will be, it'll be clearer what he was trying to say. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no, I'm glad that you did, actually. <laughs> so, um, with that in mind, uh, how will the federal party treat uh, our national energy strategy in the future? Well, we need a national energy strategy policy. We need a national set of goals around energy that would encompass, in my mind, such things as energy security. Canadians are still, we're still importing about half the oil we use in Canada, which makes uh, Harper's claim that we're an energy superpower seem a little funny. What kind of energy superpower imports half its oil from Venezuela and Kazakhstan and Saudi Arabia and who am I forgetting, Nigeria, yeah. Uh, we would, uh, energy policy should encourage 
maximizing the number of jobs per unit of production, whether we're talking solar, wind, low-scale hydro, conservation, renewables. But shipping out raw bitumen makes no sense economically at all, shipping out jobs. But that's not, because we have no energy strategy at all. And of course, fundamental to all this is that any energy strategy should be compatible with a carbon strategy that rapidly reduces the greenhouse gases coming from Canada instead of seeing them climb. So those are key pieces, not all of it, but a federal provincial energy effort to develop such a strategy, ironically recently raised by Brian Mulroney, who said in a speech in Ottawa that, there should, that, that the oil sands projects, he said, are dead as a doornail. Those were, I like the dead as a doornail. Uh, without First Nations engagement and approval of projects, environmental groups being involved and respected, which is quite something after having six or seven years of Stephen Harper going out to take the tax numbers, harass, threaten, describe environmental groups as radicals and against Canada's national interest. And here we have Brian Mulroney, of all people, defending environmental groups suddenly. And without a carbon plan and a federal provincial conversation. So it's not, I, don't, I think it's really important that we can keep this issue from being left, right, center. We had Alison Redford say, as Premier of Alberta, there should be a national energy strategy. And Stephen Harper said, no, there shouldn't be. So in the absence of a national energy strategy, what we have is a made in Houston strategy for rapid export of raw bitumen, high volume, low value exports from Canada with no constraints around carbon emissions. Um, so how the Greens federally, provincially handle this is number one, we're, we, you know, we're completely opposed to any pipeline that's shipping out raw bitumen. Now, I'm sure you got, being Albertans, you probably know that bitumen 